Welcome to one of the most hostile environments in Britain today. Yet in prehistory, it was one of the country's most sought after neighborhoods. This stone house at the heart of Bombin Moor in Cornwall has been here for 5,000 years. And believe it or not, it was once an ideal place to have a home. But what was it that drew generations of prehistoric people here? What sustained them? And why is this spot now so inhospitable? We've got three days to chuck a lot of science at this one because the digging, and there will be some digging on those houses and this cairn, may not give us all the answers. Cornwall. Behind one of the wildest and most romantic coastlines in Britain lies Bodmin Moor. Barren, windswept and dominated by huge craggy tors. Weird granite outcrops that have been sculpted by millions of years of harsh Cornish weather. This is a landscape that's been witnessed to thousands of years of human history. A recent archaeological survey recorded hundreds of prehistoric settlements here. But no one can say for sure how old they are, or even if they're all the same age. What are we looking at, Francis? Well, this is one of the best preserved landscapes in Britain because it's all on the surface. There's everything here. We're going along a trackway which is probably 4,000 years old, and it's leading up to this Bronze Age building here. Do we have any idea how many people would have lived here during the Bronze Age? Yeah? When we carried out the survey, we recorded at least 200 settlements and 1,500 individual houses within those settlements. Now, it's impossible to say whether people lived in them all the time, whether they were contemporary, and whether or not they were seasonally occupied or permanently occupied. But what we can say is certain is there were at least a couple of hundred people up here at any one point, maybe even a couple of thousand. Is this a doorway? It is, yeah. It is eerie, the idea of going into somewhere that's maybe 5,000 years old. What exactly are we going to do here, Francis? We're going to do an excavation, dig a hole, and find evidence that will suggest, yes, this was a house, or no, it was used for livestock, and we'll also date the thing. This settlement lies just under Row Tor, the second highest point in Cornwall. But it's so exposed that you wonder why people would have wanted to live up here at all. The archaeology, though, suggests that unlike now, this wind and rain swept moor was once a hive of activity. And if it was a Bronze Age settlement, then we're looking at anything between 1,000 and 3,000 years before the Romans. But it's still only a theory. It's important that we date these structures properly. And we're just the latest in a long line of archaeologists to come here. Helen, we've got a really crisp edge along here, and another one here. Isn't this a trench? Hasn't this place been dug already? Yes, you're right. A distinguished local archaeologist called Dorothy Dudley brought a team here in the late 1940s, and she dug a few small trenches through some of these features, um, and nothing more had been known until just last week we came upon a, a box with some more material in it. So it's a case at the moment of trying to put the various jigsaw puzzle pieces together and find out what she discovered. John, all I can see here is more and big stones. Is there anything that Jif is can add to the mix? Yeah, of course there is. I mean, we don't actually know that all of these are roundhouses. I mean, some of them could be stock pens, they could be clearance cairns. If we can identify areas of burning, that may indicate hearths and so help with the interpretation. Then we've got the whole landscape beyond. Well, yes, and the landscape shows up incredibly well on this wet air photograph. Um, we're standing in that roundhouse, and Dorothy Dudley also excavated in that one, and we got permission to dig there. Now, they're on either side of this great big enclosure, and wouldn't it be fantastic if we could prove that that roundhouse and that roundhouse were in use at the same time, in which case this whole thing would be a village. We're beginning our dig in the doorway. 
And the first challenge for us is working out which of these stones are part of the original walls, which stones are rubble, and which stones are just stones. If these were Bronze Age buildings, they would have looked like this. Low stone walls with timber beams forming a conical roof, which would have been covered in turf or even hides. If it was a house, there would have been a hearth in the middle for the family fire. I say if, because ten years ago, the Bodmin Moor survey assumed all the house circles here were Bronze Age. But no one's been able to accurately date the whole settlement. Some structures on the moor could be thousands of years older still, because 500 metres away to the northeast is another huge man made feature. We suspect it's Neolithic, and if it is, we're talking at least 2,000 years before the Bronze Age. This is my sort of world up here, Tony, it really is. I absolutely love these great open spaces. It's just so atmospheric, and then right in the middle of it, look. Francis believes this mysterious bank that looks like a ruined dry stone wall could be a colossal prehistoric burial mound. But we might be pushed to find any evidence. The soil here is very likely to be acidic. So in other words, bone won't be preserved. So what are we going to do here? Well, what we're going to do, we're going to put a couple of trenches where people have dug holes in the past. So here, during the Second World War, this is a training exercise. So tanks used to come thundering through here. So this time, time team's going to thunder in, and we're going to knock a hole in here on the side of the trench, and then we'll put another one up here where there was also another track. We can be, uh, be able to record the construction of this cairn and also uh, find some traces of a buried soil. What's buried soil? I thought all soil was buried. No, no. <laughs> Look, let's suppose, for example, that this cairn was, was 4,000 years old, maybe 6,000 years old. The soil that he's sitting on is going to be buried, and that will pr preserve so much information about the environment of the landscape at the time. Except, I mean, the thing is, as Phil said, it's acid, this soil. So that means we won't get bones, which is a disappointment. But we will get pollen, and that will tell us an enormous amount about the environment, the you know, trees and grasses growing in this area. This structure's over 500 metres long. And despite the foul weather, Phil can't wait to get his teeth into the archaeology. Meanwhile, geophys are working through our potential Bronze Age settlement. They're looking for signs of burning, which would have been left behind if there'd been a hearth in any of these buildings. We're also about to open a second trench over this house circle, and yet again there's evidence that it's been dug before. This time it could be our enthusiastic amateurs, or perhaps squaddies on one of their World War II exercises. I'm inclined to go for the military option. Um, I hope there are no bombs in it. But, uh, <laughs> this string that I've put here takes out a, a quadrant, a, a, about a quarter mm. of the whole thing, and makes use of that trench. And if you see, if you come right here, we're virtually opposite the mm. doorway. So if there is a hearth with any burning, it'll be right down there. Um, so I think... That's the next thing to dig, I think, isn't it? Well, that would be great because, I mean, if we find that no one has been in here before, yeah. it'd be a really good chance that if this is a house circle, we'll have a good occupation deposit and yeah. that would be the best chance for getting dating evidence and finds and then we'll be able to relate it up to that house circle up there where Matt and Helen are. Up on Phil's trench, it's difficult to see how he'll ever make any sense of this huge pile of stones. But at least he's happy. Thatcher? Yeah? What's the weather look like? It's looking good. Better than this morning. Well, at least it'll give the old pullover a chance to dry out a bit. Oh, bliss. Considering the selection of weather that's been chucked at us this morning, it seems odd to me why anyone would want to live here, or indeed go to the trouble of building a 500 metre long cairn. But our local experts think that the first settlers here were drawn towards Roe or Rao Tor. They'd have been in awe of these rocky outcrops, and there's evidence that they were worshipping here. The tours were the sort of primary landscape features that were clearly venerated by the people that lived here. 
here at uh, Rautal, we've got the hilltop enclosure, um, which we know um, was probably Neolithic in date, with other examples elsewhere on Bodmin. And these are almost certainly some kind of tribal gatherings, uh, centres for ritual ceremonies, a meeting place for people to come together and sort of celebrate their lives within the landscape. Stewart also believes Rotor provides a connection between the mysterious stone bank and the much later settlement. He suspects both are focused on the tour, but proving it can't be achieved by digging alone. Well, he would say that, wouldn't he? I think it's one of those sites where what's below ground actually might not be as informative as actually what's above ground. There's the stone sizes, there's the shape and size of, of these banks or cairns, whatever they are. We can look at how they're constructed, what they line up within the landscape. So this is a classic case. We've got to start looking at the obvious and try to understand what it's telling us. Hello. Hello. In Phil's trench, he's beginning to suspect this bank is far from being a random pile of stones. And you've got one there and another very, very flat one in there. In fact, you've got one here on edge. And what I'm noticing too, this is bang on line with the edge of the cairn. There's a load of upstanding stone. They just stick up out of the ground. Oh, yeah. And they go right the way through here. I reckon this is going to prove to be the edge of the cairn, the build-up and the makeup of it is going to be over that side, and on that side is the collapse where it's fell out. Tumble up. And I've got exactly the same thing on my side. So mid-afternoon on day one, and it feels as if we're close to some sort of discovery. And we're beginning to make progress in other areas as well. This morning, Phil and Francis were banging on about buried soils, and we've now taken our first samples from the site. This should help us get a snapshot of what was going on in the prehistoric landscape. What can you do with this mud once we've dug it up? Ah, uh, well, we can learn all sorts of things from a sieve of mud like this, believe it or not. We can look at the pollen grains. They tell us about the vegetation which is growing around the site. We can look at the plant macrofossils, the seeds, and they can tell us about insects, and they're a very good indicator of the environment and also of climatic change as well. Anything else? Uh, there's also a test we can do, it's called soil phosphate analysis. What does that do? Well, what we do is we take samples of soil from the trenches and we apply a series of chemicals, and the, that will uh, tell us how much phosphate there is in that soil sample. So it's not just fettling around with mud and spider's legs? Right? It certainly isn't. What can you learn? What can you tell us? Well, it's, I've always argued that we cannot understand sites like this without this sort of environmental information. It may not be as exciting as your big walls up there or your big field boundaries um, or your, your flint tools, but it's just as important. In our first stone circle, we're still trying to find a hearth to help us identify this as a Bronze Age house rather than a cattle pen. And then there's our other target. Phil's getting more and more confident that this is a purpose-built structure and one of the most extraordinary he's ever dug. And this tiny piece of flint might be the first evidence we have that this cairn is much earlier than anything else on the site. I just get so excited about that. That is absolutely magnificent. What sort of date we're looking at for it up here? Well, much of it is very early, Mesolithic, you know, six, seven... BC. And I was just wondering whether or not it's a tiny, tiny chip, whether they've got, say, a scraper or something like that, and it gets dulled, yes. and they're actually resharpening it. Well, a lot of the scatters that we get are like that, where you get a lot of flakes and retouching material and not much in the way of tools. And, of course, if, if, you, if you've got to bring flint, what, from the coast? That's where we think most of it comes on Bob Minmore. It comes from the beach pebbles that you get on the coast, about 10 miles from here, I suppose. So, in other words, this stuff is, is very valuable material. So if you've got a, a, a blunt flint tool, it pays you to resharpen yeah, it. Yeah. One of the things that I was particularly interested in is where it's coming from. Because What do you say it was? Right down in that bottom there, Tracy? Yeah, there's just this dark soil down the dark layer down here. It's quite compacted and dry. See, I wonder whether we're not beginning to get into either the surface that was here when this thing was put up, yep. or whether we could be in the top of a, of a buried soil. Yes, well, that's what we're hoping for, isn't it? Exactly. A buried soil beneath this structure, whatever it is. 
the light here on Rotor would have been as dramatic to the ancients as it is to us today. They worshipped the sun and ran their lives by it. And thinking about it, so do we. Despite the impetuous weather, it's been a good first day in our two house circles. The diggers have finally got into their stride. Over at the Cairn, they're now looking at stones that haven't been seen for thousands of years. And look at this. We're now deeper than the antiquarians got down to. And this surface, too, is maybe 5,000 years old. And tomorrow, we're going to dig into it to see whether this was a place where people lived or maybe where they buried their dead. Day two on Bodmin Moor. We've come here to unravel the mystery of this deserted landscape that once attracted generations of Britain's earliest settlers. Yesterday, John's geophys results were what we euphemistically call <laughs> inconclusive. But today you're much happier, aren't you? Yeah, they, they are. They're quite exciting because we're getting the bigger picture now. I mean, these areas of enhancement at this end of the survey, when you actually overlay them, on the roundhouses, they coincide exactly. Whereas at this end, we're not seeing any enhancement with the roundhouses. So what do you think that enhancement might be? Well, the enhancement, I think, is burning. And so that could be hearths. So it suggests that these might well be lived in. And that's right here? Yes, but th there is a problem. Dorothy Dudley actually excavated far more of these roundhouses than we thought. It's just possible that we're seeing excavation disturbance. By coincidence, Tony, I actually have her plan here. Now, that one there, with the very high enhancement, happens to be this one, and she doesn't appear to put a trench in it at all. So are you happy for us to dig this house? Because so far, we've only been allowed to dig houses that have already been disturbed. And that's because we didn't want to damage sites unnecessarily and also to save you time because the trenches are there. But we do want to get the story out of this site and we do need dates and hearths give you dates, the potential for dates through radiocarbon dating. This large stone behind Francis here may be the site of the hearth. It would certainly be great from our point of view if we were able to dig, as it were, a virgin circle, wouldn't it? Oh, it would be fantastic, a fantastic opportunity, yeah. Now we can get on to some undisturbed archaeology in our new Trench 3. And with Helen's team still digging Trench 1 and Bridges team busy in Trench 2, we've got a fair chance of finding the occupation evidence that we're desperate for. What seems to be the, the floor layer in the, in the house, so... We've also got our environmental laboratory in a nearby farmhouse, where Ben and Emma are examining the buried soils from the site to try to build up a picture of how the landscape looked and how it changed over the last 10,000 years. Yeah, it, it, looks, it looks a lot more organic, actually, in the trench itself. But... Another archaeological tool at our disposal is radiocarbon dating on organic remains such as wood, bone and plant material. Back on site in Trench 1, Helen and Matt are beginning to make sense of Dorothy Dudley's 1950s dig. I think you can vaguely see across here where it used to be and there's fewer stones, but um, mm. we, we've gone out beyond that and you can see here all, all these, these collapsed stones here which just go over the wall of the house there. There's masses of them. It's huge. I'm, yeah. in front, I think there might be even too many for a wall there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we have had a, few, um, a, a couple of finds as well. There you go, a little thumb scraper. Oh, wow, look at that. And it's been burnt. Yeah, it's burnt flint and it was found outside the walls just over there. Oh, that's interesting because the two scrapers that were found by Dorothy Dudley's team were also outside. Look, there are these dots oh. there just outside the entrance. And have you seen anything that might be a target for carbon dating? Possibly. You see these, the, the lake that we've come down onto there. Yeah, it's all quite nice, black. Nice dark black and in the very centre of it there mm -hmm. is in fact a, a quite a strong concentration of charcoal. I think we, if we put a, a slot across the back or something and got a section down there and got a good sample of it, yeah. we probably could get something. At last, we're getting to grips with these stone circles. We've got trenches open in two separate buildings and it would be fantastic if they were both part of the same potential Bronze Age village. But without doubt, the biggest mystery on the site is Phil's Neolithic cairn built 6,000 years ago by the earliest farmers who only had stone tools.
This monumental structure is over 500 metres long, and Francis believes it's no coincidence that it points east and towards the Tor. He's also convinced that it's unique in Britain, with only one or two other Neolithic monuments even remotely like it. When we were up here yesterday in the pouring rain, it looked to me like a rather random jumble of stones that you might put up to stop sheep wandering about. <laughs> but looking at it now, it looks like a really big structure. Well, the thing is, Tony, about these really big structures, they're very carefully put together, or the whole thing collapses. So I'm hoping that Phil has got good evidence for how the thing was actually built. I mean, you can actually see it on the surface, Tony. I mean, if you look up the monument, you can see that there are actually two parallel rows of stones running right the way up its length. And we've actually got some evidence of it in the trench here. Look, there's that big boulder which is sticking up through the surface of the grass. And we've got these big boulders coming down here. And actually the infill is much smaller boulders. And if you really want to see the other side much more clearly, look at that whacking great stone in there. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what you've got are these, these two parallel, they're, they're like walls, and the infill is just rubble. They're just heaving stones in. Now, outside of that, we've got more stones. And yesterday, I thought that this was tumble, stuff that had slipped off the top and slipped down either side. But when you look at these stones here, look, there's that one, all of those, they're all flat, they're all interleaving. And if, if, if stones tip off the top of a monument like this, what they don't do is, is lie flat, they just kind of tip and jumble all together. So now I think that these stones are actually part of the monument and probably laid in against the sides, really to strengthen both of these walls. So do you think the original shape would have been like a gentle slope and then a flat top? Yes, I think it is. I think it's definitely got a real definite shape to it. What about the buried soil? Well, we're just beginning to get a point where I think we've got it. At the top is this sort of browny grey stuff. But the important bit is this very black stuff. Now that black stuff is the buried soil. But the important thing is that it's underneath this stone here. OK, we've got something that looks like a wall, but how do we know it's prehistoric? Why couldn't it be from any period? Well, it's the formality of that facing which is very, very striking. It's been deliberately placed there, and I think placed there to be seen from either side. And this is exactly what you get around the huge Neolithic burial mounds, the chambered tombs of Orkney and Ireland and all over the place. And that is very much a Neolithic feature, or even an earlier Bronze Age feature. I'm, I'm actually quite excited about it, because I think that's as diagnostic as anything else uh, we've found today. Absolutely. It would have been a heck of a lot of work. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the whole point of these huge monuments is to bring families and people together from a, from a large area of countryside. So a, the big monument represents a whole series of, of, of gatherings of the tribes. It's job creation, it's keeping the unemployment figures <laughs> down. <laughs> <laughs> to think that people were designing and building structures like this up to 6,000 years ago is mind-boggling. The next big question, of course, is what was the Neolithic thinking behind such a huge monument? Meanwhile, down the hill, work in our house circle trenches is painfully slow. We're almost halfway through our three-day dig and we're still waiting for dating evidence. Francis has no doubt these house circles are Bronze Age, but Bridges just discovered something that could upset all our expectations. I was looking in the top sort of over the other side of the trench and I've come across this, this bit of green glass and uh, this piece of um, vessel rib. Oh, right. It looks a bit suspicious to me for the prehistoric or post-medieval periods. <laughs> um, well, this is going to throw a cat in among the pigeons because this is Roman glass. <laughs> it's the rim and then the shoulder mm. with a little piece of wild tra white trail slip along the bottom. Oh, I see. It is a little bit lighter just there. That's... Well, it's very rare for Cornwall and I'd say it's about 2nd or 3rd century AD, which is a great surprise. I got to admit, I hadn't expected to find Roman glass out here in the middle of Bodmin Moor. The first really juicy find from these house circles and it's definitely not Bronze Age. 
but it does suggest that Roman tourists or pilgrims might have come up here to visit these ancient ruins anything from a thousand to three thousand years after the buildings went out of use. You'll have to see turf by hand. Because... Raksha's now opening our third trench in the house circles. Go for it! <laughs> this is the first structure we've dug that hasn't been excavated before and we've got great hopes for the finds here. Up on the bank cairn, Phil's ready to give up his buried soil for environmental examination. Get your fingers crossed. There we go. That's a good one, is it? That's not bad, yeah. We've got the uh, transition from this, this lower, you know, the orange uh, natural material into the to slightly more organic. And this is the material we're hoping there'll be some preservation of, of pollen in here. It's so incredible that all that potential information is just in that little block little of, dirt. of dirt. Yeah. That's archaeology. <laughs> <laughs> now archaeology is big walls and finds and layers. You know. <laughs> Ben's been taking samples like this from all over Bodmin Moor for several years. By analysing the pollen grains in the soil, he's been able to paint a vivid picture of what this landscape looked like right through prehistory, even from before the time the cairn was built. And this is a a grain of oak pollen from work that's previously been carried out at this site from a peat deposit just, just next to the archaeology. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is the peat layers build up over thousands of years. This sample's about 4,000 BC. Peat layers build up and we can extract samples from that peat deposit and we basically will count the pollen grains in, those, in that sediment and that will basically give us a picture of the way the environment has changed through time. And what we find for the prehistoric layers is, as, I, as you, you can see the grain of oak pollen there, if I just scan across the slide, you can see there's quite a few so there's another one there. Mm -hmm. and there's, there's other grains such as hazel in there as well. So basically we're getting lots of grains of oak pollen, hazel pollen, that's suggesting that we actually have quite a dense oak hazel woodland. But just because you've got pollen in the sediments here, that doesn't necessarily mean that there were oak trees here, does it? The pollen could have flown in from somewhere else. And what we find is that we actually tally up the number of, of grains on the slide and obviously the higher percentages of tree pollen, you know, the more confidence we can have in ascribing a forest environment to this habitat, basically. And from the work that you've done, how would you describe what the habitat was like here? For, for that sample, around about 4000 BC, uh, we're starting to reconstruct each of the periods, and this is, this is the 4000 BC one. Um, what, what you're seeing is really quite a dense woodland running right up to effectively the tops of the tors, um, only really restricted by the stone where there's no soil for the trees to grow effectively. So you, you just have very dense oak hazel woodland, possibly bits of older in the river valleys as well. Um, but it's, it's completely different to how it is now, and certainly more sheltered. From this work on Bodmin Moor, Ben and Henry have been able to track how man has changed this landscape. 10,000 years ago, in Mesolithic times, hunter-gatherers would have roamed through forests here, searching for food and shelter. 3,000 years later, at the dawn of the Neolithic period, they began to choose places to settle, and cleared this landscape to graze their animals. A few thousand years later still, in the Bronze Age, they began to farm on a big scale, clearing even more of the woodland. So when did people start chopping the trees down? About 4000 BC, at the beginning of the Neolithic. How did they do it? The stone axes, it must have taken forever. <laughs> well, yes, that's how we used to think. But we do now know that throughout the Mesolithic, people were managing the edges of woodland uh, using fire. And then every so often, the fire would get out of control and burn down a great swathe of land. So um, they did both, I think. Why did they start clearing the land? Well, the original purpose was probably to clear land for farming. But there are only a few hundred or at most a few thousand people around here then. Surely they wouldn't have needed to use all this for fields. Well, I think there was more to it than that, Tony. And the dreaded word is ritual. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> look, come this way, I'll show you what I mean. Now, look out there, Tony. Uh, it's a different world. You can see the skyline, you can see the, the, the bank can pointing at the skyline. I mean, if you were a Neolithic person, that would have been the realm of the ancestors. That would have been a special and probably rather terrifying place up there. Francis and Stuart are suggesting that the early farmers cleared avenues through the trees so they could have a constant view of the tour. Although I'm puzzled why they didn't just clear the whole lot. 
you need to encourage the animals, you need to hunt the animals to feed, and they need, they need things like this to feed on. You'd have to leave stands of trees for the animals. You'd also want to encourage this spirituality thing as well by leaving gaps in the trees to enhance how you view these monuments and so on. So you've got to view it as being a mixture. So whatever this ritual was, it was a balance between woodland and moorland? Absolutely. And other squalls coming our way, and we're having to protect the work we've done so far. Left a bit. In some ways, it's been a very frustrating day. We found nothing archaeological to tell us when people were living in these house circles, or if they ever did live in them. But it's a different story in Phil's trench we're beginning to establish that this was a carefully designed and built piece of architecture. And I can't help but think that all that effort and construction has got something to do with the powerful presence of Row Tor. We're losing the light now and the mist's coming in. You can hardly see Rotor anymore. And all day we've been beavering away at this stone circle, although frankly to very little avail, until in the last few minutes Ian discovered this. It's a hearth. In other words, people were living here. This isn't just an animal pen or a cairn. It's part of a settlement. But when were people here and what were they doing? Hopefully we'll find out tomorrow. It's the beginning of day three on Bodmin Moor in Cornwall, and it's been tipping down all night. But at least this morning's looking good. Well, maybe not in the trenches. Somewhere under here, we're fishing for some clues to help us understand a potential group of Bronze Age houses. We're also trying to work out what the purpose of this massive stone bank is, a structure that supposedly predates the houses by at least 2,000 years. The real key to unravelling this whole site is to get dates. Is there any chance that we'll be able to find out before the end of the day? Well, I hope so, Tony, because under that murky, dark water that Ian's sponging off there, there is a half. And that hearth has got charcoal in it, and that charcoal will give us a radiocarbon date that will fix the period when this house was in use. But science can be fallible, and none of our radiocarbon samples subsequently proved to be conclusive. So actually, the best method for dating these houses will be good old-fashioned archaeology. A piece of pottery would be nice. I should do for time, please. Over at Phil's Trench, the Neolithic bank cairn is proving to be a far more complex structure than we could ever have expected. So rather than going for a second trench, Phil's decided to concentrate all his efforts on deciphering this cross-section of the monument. In World War II, the army drove tanks straight through this bank. And although this desecration hacks Phil off, there's a big plus. Yeah, it's a veritable arsenal look. <laughs> They've been used. That one's got a really dented end. Yeah, we don't know what that blue hard. one is. Really <laughs> explosive. Just... But then, of course, we found this this morning. Look, these barbed wire, and that's in yeah. amongst the stones. And that's the consistent thing. It's yeah. all in amongst it. All amongst rubbly the stones. Loose, voidy stones. Yeah. yeah. These World War II finds confirm that some of the loose stones on the sides weren't part of the original Neolithic structure and must have been redeposited when the tanks breached the cairn. That one's a really interesting one, actually. The, uh, in the lab, the we're adding to our picture of the landscape as it looked when it was first farmed. They're dung beetles. Where'd you get them? We got them from the section where we were doing the processing in the uh, stream. And what do they tell us? Um, they actually tell us about the environment. They're telling us that there were animals uh, grazing in the area uh, when the deposit was formed. How can you work that out? 
because there was lots of dung, and that's what they were interested in. OK, this tells us there was animal dung here, but can you work out which animals the dung came from? You can sometimes, yes. Um, they tend to be associated with large herbivores, such as cows, um, sheep, goat, and pigs and horses and things like that. So, yeah, they can be quite useful. Is it true you sometimes dream about beetles? It is, Tony, yes. What kind of dreams? Um, I had a nightmare about one last, one last night. <laughs> this is a big one? It was a very big one. <laughs> <clears throat> Emma's dung beetles confirm that livestock such as cows and sheep have been grazing these uplands for at least 5,000 years. And we may also be getting closer to knowing when early farmers occupied these houses. We're still digging all three stone circles. Last night we discovered a hearth in Trench 1, and Ian's digging through that very carefully and is coming up with material that the people who lived here might have thrown in the fire. There you go. It's a broken piece of flint. Very nice. In Trench 2, Bridge is struggling with her first find of the day. But it's not delicate archaeology she's dealing with. Oh, oh, sorry, that was really tricky. <laughs> no. The frog's bite. In Trench 3, Rapture's nearly ready to lift some of the stones. This is the one house circle that hasn't been dug before, and underneath we should have intact Bronze Age archaeology. We've also found a scatter of stones in all three of our house circles. And Francis is sure it's not a coincidence. This is a house. I'm in little doubt about that because there's a hearth there. But... <laughs> You look in front of you here, there's a large heap of rocks, and that heap of rocks looks for all the world like a cairn, and cairns are normally burial mounds. It's a bit strange turning your house into a burial, isn't it? And it is possible, of course, that there is a burial here, a dead person beneath that cairn, but it's also possible that it's a cairn to the house, to the life in the house. What do you mean by that? Well, it's very difficult to leave a home, isn't it? Especially if you've enjoyed living in that home, if you've enjoyed being on right, or you're leaving it forever, you turn the house into a cairn, turn it into a monument. Oh, it is a lovely idea, that, isn't there? Is there any way we can test it? If we carefully unpick this cairn, we can see whether it, it comes after the house or, or late phase of the house. It could be that they make the house a monument, but they may also be burying artefacts of life. The artefacts they use, like pot and other things in the house, could be found underneath the cairn, decommissioned in the same way. That would be good. Ooh. It's just after lunch on our final day, and at last something's come up in Trench 3 that could focus this whole dig. It's a small sherd of pottery. And this could be the first piece of evidence that puts our house circle firmly into the Bronze Age. Carl, I'm so, so excited about this, because this is the first piece of pottery we've had in this trench. Well, I think you've every right to be excited. Um, this is um, Bronze Age pottery. It's what we call Trevisca ware here in Cornwall. It dates from the Middle Bronze Age, so yes, this is a very exciting piece. And I've just noticed on the interior, if you look carefully, you can see the black area. Yeah. That's actually internal residue, and that's the last meal that was cooked in this pot. So we're, we're, we're thinking it's about 1500? Yeah, it's around about 1500 BC. It's odd that something that looks so insignificant can tell us so much. This piece of Cornish Trevisca ware confirms this was a Bronze Age home. And what's more, we know they were cooking here three and a half thousand years ago. Back in the farmhouse, Ben and Emma are beginning to run tests on some floor surfaces from the house in Trench 1 and material from Phil's cairn. Organic matter, such as discarded food or animal dung, rots down and leaves phosphates. Animal dung was commonly used as fuel in Bronze Age houses, and by running these tests, it could give us an indication of the level of human activity. Oh, look, you can see it going already over here, which is always good. Oh, yeah. You can just see here, you see the sort of blue halo we've got developing there. Mm. Now, the faster the sample goes blue is also meant to be a sign of high levels of, of, of phosphate. So if we keep an eye on which samples are going quickly... But it's quite interesting, that's because of the half. Ah, now there you go. <laughs> because... Well, obviously, you sat around the fire, it's waste, rubbish being dropped onto the ground, and that's, that's persists in the soil over, over the millennia, basically. 
Emma, what are your initial impressions? Um, basically, we've got the hearth sample that's gone very blue, very quickly, lots of phosphite, lots of activity. All the way through the, the centre of the house, we've got, you know, again, evidence of phosphite. And even outside of the door, and that's really gone quite blue, and that went quite fast, didn't yeah. it, Ben? Yeah. Again, we've got evidence of phosphate. On the lower line, there are three that have hardly any phosphate at all and one with just a tinge. Where were they from? Phil's trench in the bank cairn. Um, as you can see, we're not really getting much evidence for, for phosphate, high phosphate levels in those at all. So, you know, clear distinction between the different trenches in terms of the concentration of phosphates in the soils. This is the sort of science I can really identify with. These organic remains have been locked in the soil for thousands of years. The phosphates also tell us there was little human or animal activity near the cairn. It was possibly a place kept sacred to the memory of the ancestors. Back on the moor, real archaeology is catching up with the science. Bronze Age pottery seems to be coming up everywhere. In Trench 1, Matt's found some more near the hearth. For two and a half thousand year old pot, this is really special. It's got that decoration on it, hasn't it? Yeah, where the, where the cord's been the, pressed into it. Yes, it's Trevisca ware. It's exactly like what Carl was showing me earlier on. That's, that's some time in the Bronze Age, isn't it, Francis? Yes, it is. It's in the Middle Bronze Age, to be precise, um, ah. between roughly 1500 BC and 1000 BC. Right. And this is another piece, oh. also of Trevisca ware, but oh. I think slightly classier, that yeah. one, with the cord impressed. Uh, chevrons, zigzags. Absolutely. And that yeah. came from Rakshar's trench along with another right. little bit in here. Now, the importance of that, of course, is that all of this pottery is identical. Mm. And that means that the three houses that we've dug out of all of these houses are all contemporary. And that means, I would guess, a penny to a quid, but all of the houses are part of a village. So we have ourselves a Middle Bronze Age village. That is absolutely <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> This is the first time that anyone's been able to confirm that this is a Bronze Age village, which is a great achievement. And our environmental team can add to the story. There's no evidence in the pollen analysis that our Bronze Age farmers grew any crops up here. It seems they carried on clearing the trees for fuel, and over the centuries, the soil became too acidic to support anything else. It would seem that unwittingly, Generation after generation of Bronze Age people were responsible for changing the face of Bodmin Moor forever. Raksha's team were the first to find that much needed dating evidence. And with just an hour to go, they've uncovered something else that could take the history of this settlement back much further. If I just put those two pieces together there, I think the brilliant thing about this is that is an old break. You can see the dirt in there. Mm. Uh, so they've used it, it's broken, and they've just thrown it back in there. And you're actually at the bottom now, aren't you? I am, yeah. That, that's Thanks. fantastic. That's like the best dating evidence that we <laughs> could have. Our finds people are very excited by this manky bit of flint. Technically, it's a bit of rubbish, a byproduct from making a prehistoric blade or scraper. They believe it could be early Neolithic, about 6,000 years old. And this tells us that this settlement actually goes back to the time the earliest settlers were building the cairn. It's one of the most enigmatic structures we've ever investigated on Time Team. And Phil's the first archaeologist to have been allowed to excavate it fully. I don't think television can give you a sense of the magic of this monument. It's so big in the landscape. There's so much work involved in it, and it points so dramatically at the tour. So what do we do, guys? We dig a sucking great hole in the middle of it. Why did we do that, Francis? Well, I think it's essential, Tony, that we actually get down to the buried land surface, the old topsoil under the monument, right at the centre. Why? What's so important about that? Well, you know, throughout this whole project, we've been thinking and talking about the buried soils. What that does is represents the, the environment that was there when they began the monument. It's the first part of the story. And the first part of the story of this part of the site is that they took the turf off. And that's crucially important because 
we know from other sites in Britain that the, the actual alignment of, of, of the bank or, or the barrow was actually cleared of soil first. It's a sort of religious ritual purification of the ground before you put bodies in it. Once they'd actually prepared the ground, what they would have done was to make these two parallel walls. And what they did was they got these socking great stones and, and put them in endways on. And as they did that, they filled up the gap in the middle with all this rubble and gradually built the whole thing up. I rather suspect that it was probably just about as high as you see it now. And then on the outside of it, they stood these, they lent these big f slabs of granite against the walls which would have given this, from, an, from a distance, it would have given this a great impression of gleaming white boulders of granite that would have stood out for miles. And then on either side, they paved off the areas as well. And might they have used those turfs that they'd taken off and well, put them on top? Absolutely, and that would make it even more spectacular, because you'd have the white granite, and then you'd have the green turf, and that would provide a smooth walkway along the top of this thing. as a sort of processional way. It would have been unbelievably spectacular. I must say, Phil, often you show me prehistoric finds and your eyes are full of crazed excitement and I'm thinking it's actually a bit boring but this has got to be one of the best pieces of archaeology that we've ever done on Time Team, hasn't it? It's certainly one of the best I've done in oh, donkey's years. This feature shows us just how sophisticated the ancient people were in their relationship with the landscape. They'd have thought of the tour as we now think of a cathedral or mosque and on solstices and other significant feast days, they'd have left their homes to process towards the rising sun to commune with their ancestors. And the spirit of Rotor is as potent now as it was then, continuing to draw pilgrims here for thousands of years, from the Roman times up to the present day. We're finishing this dig as we started it, in the blustery rain looking at this huge, magnificent monument. A boulder cairn, a boundary cairn, there isn't even a proper name for it. But what is certain is that it meant a great deal to the people who constructed it. And it was part of a much wider landscape, which hopefully will mean as much to the people who look after it in the future as it did to those who built it 6,000 years ago. Well, the series may be over, but don't despair. Log on to the website at channel4.com slash timeteam to relive all the excitement of past digs. Sharks 11, Tigers 7, which way will Louis go? Shipwrecked, Battle of the Islands, next.